Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another installment of Rebel Without Applause, coming to you as I always do from this, my nutshell of infinite space. By that, I mean my television studio apartment right here in the wood of my holly under the sign overlooking the COVID addled but still somehow some way enchanted land of law. I'm right here in the creative confines of Cretona and today I have an incredibly special guest. This gentleman is coming to us courtesy of a digital thread and thread is an important word here in this discussion all the way uh, from Germany. He's a professor at Harvard in history, American history, and he wrote the most incredible book, which I had the privilege of reading, I guess, two or three years ago. It's called Empire of Cotton, A Global History, and I have to say, it rocked my world. It was so informative and so interesting, and it offered a lens to understand, a distant mirror, I should say, uh, to help understand the world we're in today. He's with me. He's on the other side of the line. I need to shut up. He needs to talk. Welcome, Sven Beckert. How are you? Hi, Bill. Good <laughs> to be with you. Uh, likewise. I read this book, and I have to say, it was so satisfying on an academic level, but you triumphed in a way that so many academic books fail because it was so eminently readable. It offered up such an incredibly dramatic and intimate narrative at the same time it was global in its scope. So I wanted to just say that right off the bat, one, to compliment you, and two, as a powerful recommendation to anybody who listens to this uh, podcast. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Now, you just mentioned about that was, I guess, part of your one of your goals as a writer is to try to make this and also obligations uh, to make this accessible, not only to the priestly class of professors and elite universities, but to folks like me. No, look, I, I, I believe history is a topic that, uh, that very many people are interested in. Uh, in some ways, everyone thinks about history in some ways, maybe not in an academic way, but we all think about history because we are curious where we come from and we are trying to understand the past in order also to get a better understanding where we might be going next. And I, because historians have the privilege of potentially having large audiences, I think we also have a responsibility to try to communicate with audiences outside uh, the discipline itself, outside the universities themselves. And, uh, and the book, uh, The Empire of Cotton, uh, deals with a lot of issues that are of you know, great and immediate relevance uh, for, for most people in the United States thinking about history, but also for people in other parts of the world thinking about history, such as uh, the, you know, the, the, the biggest possible questions about the, the global history of capitalism, uh, but then also uh, issues of, uh, of, of slavery, of, of, of racism, of, of labor, of industrial development, uh, so I tried to make an effort from the get-go to, to communicate in ways that, that was accessible. Um, and I also believe, look, if you, have some, if, you, if you understand yourself what it is you want to say, then you can say it in, in ways that most people are, are, are able to understand it. I think much academic writing is, is, is obscure partly because the authors themselves haven't perhaps quite figured out what, what, what they meant to say. And... Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I tried to write in ways that was uh, ex accessible, uh, but, but at the same time, you know, the book is partly a narrative. It tells all kinds of stories about all kinds of places in all parts of the world, I think literally on all continents. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, it, but I'm also trying to provide a kind of deeply analytical account. So, so it, it has a lot of ideas about how the world worked in the past couple of hundred years. Uh, but uh, and and some of these ideas are n you know not not simple. I mean they're quite complicated. But I try to communicate them in ways uh, that are accessible uh, to, to 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 many people. And and somehow you know this is what I mean. The book was published a while ago, and it, it has sold very many copies in very many different parts of the world. So it does seem to speak. Uh, to, to, to larger uh, segments of the, of the public. Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you this. Earlier this year, before the COVID bomb hit, I, I was doing my podcast in South Carolina covering the election, and I had to drive from a small little rural precinct to uh, Columbia, South Carolina, across these lowland counties, and I was saw these little white fluffy balls blowing across the two-lane blacktop, and here I was in the heart of the old Confederacy where it all got really really got started just a few miles outside of Charleston. I was looking at those cotton balls and all I can think of was 
all the human misery associated with that supply chain from that cotton ball and that feel to the T-shirt that I was wearing and the history behind it. And you nailed that. I mean, what, what I'm trying to do in some ways is I'm trying to take something that's very familiar to all of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we think about cotton, you know, we are all wearing cotton fabrics. Many of us have seen, like you have seen cotton fields. Uh, many of us have seen uh, textile factories, or at least have seen the museums uh, uh, that are now housed in former textile factories. So this is something that's all around us, but often we don't recognize how that uh, that, that very common uh, thing, the cotton, how that uh, actually is a potential way of getting at understanding really important things about the history of the past couple of hundred years. You know, I read this book, I forget the title, you probably read it, it's, it was about, it was a sort of a similar take, but it, it was about petroleum and how that also yeah, yeah, offered... Yeah, yeah, I forget yeah. the name. Yeah. That's a very good book too, yeah, that's a very good book. Yeah, you, it, they live in the yeah, same... Yeah, Jürgen, right. It lives in the yeah. same genre, I think, how one commodity can just be so revealing about the system that we're in. And, you know, when I looked at this book and tried to think about capitalism through fresh eyes, it made me ask, well, I'm a Cold War baby. You know, I grew up thinking this was a bipolar world between, like, capitalism and communism. But then I re it seems to me after reading your book that some of those communists make very good capitalists, especially in China. And so it made me think, well, what the hell is capitalism? Y you know? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, the book, by, the book by the end goes, you know, it, it, I, I don't spend much time on, 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 the, on the Cold War and I don't <laughs> spend much time writing about the Soviet Union or communist China. But, but, it, that, but, but by the end, I, I, I do talk a little bit about the vast expansion of cotton agriculture and the textile industry, both in the Soviet Union and in, in China. And, uh, you know, I didn't set out to discuss that problem, nor do I spend very much time on it. But, 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 but like you, I was struck myself by how similar some of these efforts by the Soviet Union uh, uh, or uh, Communist China were to what the things that had happened many decades earlier uh, in, in places such as uh, India or Africa, powered by the, by the European colonial powers. So, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so there is a certain kind of con continuity. And, and I think one important element of this continuity, and that's also one of the main arguments that I'm trying to make in the book, is that when we think about the development of, of the modern world, when we think about capitalism, broadly speaking, we usually think about... Um, about industry, you know, the, these new textile mills or the new iron and steel mills or the coal mines uh, or the coal factories. Uh, and when we do so, we usually think about cities. So our, our ideas about modernity, our ideas about the modern world are really focused on the urban and on industry. But what you see when you look at a, at a, at a, at a commodity such as cotton, you see that the transformations that made the modern world possible, that made modern capitalism possible, took as much place in the countryside and in agriculture as they did in cities and in, uh, and, and in, uh, in industry. And I think that is the case both for the history of capitalism, but, but it, and that's the broad similarity then also uh, to the history of, 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 of communism, that the relationship there to the countryside is not so different from the, the relationship under capitalism. You know, one of the things, and you talk about the origins of capitalism and, and the state as sort of the, I don't know, the point of the spear to, to open these markets or to enforce and coerce the labor. All I could think about was the first act of Othello, written in 1600s by a British person, but it takes place in Venice. And these Venetian senators are very interested in defending the sea lanes and securing the island of Cyprus for their traders specifically so they could probably trade with the Levant and, you know, the Middle East for spices and maybe even cotton in 1600 in small quantities. Certainly, certainly, absolutely. They, they would have definitely traded cotton. The Venetians were important in the, in the early European trade in cotton. Right, and I thought, well, this is capitalism at work. It's proto-capitalism. And, you know, these senators were influenced by the merchant class and their own societies. And I guess this is maybe an example of war capitalism, Although the play takes a very different turn, you know, as you get into it. But I go, the context of this, to me, it's like, okay, this is, at least in Europe, and you're, one of the things you really 
brilliantly do is your storytelling is not necessarily Eurocentric, it's global centric. Um, you know, you've flown the drone way up higher than the Western world to get other other portraits. But, you know, those that play and also the merchant to Venice, it seems like, OK, this is like the beginning of capitalism, you know, at least in Europe. And I don't know if that was something that informed your thinking when you wrote this book. And I know you're writing another book about the history of capitalism. You pick such quaint and small subjects. I don't know how you can cover them, but... <laughs> I don't know if that had any resonance with you, those plays or that those sort of dramatic expressions of capitalism. I mean, and I, I think when I wrote Empire of Cotton, not so much. And in some ways, when I wrote this book, I started out by wanting to write a global history of cotton. And only while I was researching that history and while I was starting to write that history, it dawned on me that the history of cotton actually tells us a lot about the history of global capitalism as well. And so the theme of global capitalism became more important as time went uh, as time went by i mean the book i'm currently writing as you mentioned on the global history of capitalism is is it exactly starts in places like venice but also in in in, in, in cities in india and china and elsewhere uh, and i and i focus on these early merchant communities uh, as 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 the beginnings of of capitalism so you're absolutely uh, you're absolutely right but i think you know when it comes to empire of cotton um the, 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 the theme that is important to the Venetian story, but also then to the entire story of, uh, of the empire of cotton and to the entire story of, of, of capitalism, is that, that usually when we think about, uh, uh, about capitalism, we think about these merchants, we think about these uh, industrialists, uh, we think maybe about the planters uh, and the workers on, on the plantations and then the factories. But often we keep the history of the state, the history of government, as kind of separate from that history. And especially in the United States, there's a kind of popular thinking about capitalism as, as if capitalism is somehow the opposite of the state. I mean, many people seem to believe that the less state, the more capitalism, and the more state, the less capitalism there is. Right. But I think what the history of the global history of cotton shows so well is that, that, that the history of capitalism is really a co-production of uh, entrepreneurs, merchants, industrialists, and others, and the institutions of the state. And, you know, that's, also, of course, also very much the case when you think about, uh, about the early history of, of, of Venice. But you, but you cannot even start to think about capitalism without also thinking about the public powers that create the institutions, the structures, the sea lanes, the military power right. that, that enables this entire system to take off. And that's very much the case. Uh, that becomes very clear uh, when you when you when you uh, with, when you disentangle the global history of cotton. Right. So, like, you know, any any modern American political debate, a Republican or a conservative person might say, "I, I just want government off my back." And yes. I and your and your point is, no, dude, government has your back, and it always has. And you wouldn't have half or a quarter of anything what you have if it wasn't for the armies and the tariffs and the coercion that you're sitting on. Exactly, These exactly <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. It, it, it makes historically it's it's completely nonsensical to think of that as an opposition, as a principal opposition. Right. It is a co-production. You <laughs> cannot think about capitalism without also thinking about the state. Of course, the state can do all kinds of things. You know, I mean, some uh, some good, some not so good, uh, and and there's a whole variety of different kinds of capitalism, both in time as well as in space. Uh, but uh, but but no matter what capitalism you think of, you cannot think of it as separate from the from from the state. Where does racism sort of begin in this uh, calculus and economics end, or where is it a chicken and an egg? Or right, I mean that's a, a, a very important uh, a, a question, and one that's not easy to be disentangled because, in some ways, of course, both these factors did uh, did did play a role, but. But, but look, the, the most basic thing to be said about this is that uh, the, the, the global cotton industry is, is, is very central to the, to, the, to the history of industrialization. It is very central to the history of capitalism. It is very central to what has been called the Great Divergence, the moment when the West, when Europe and the mm -hmm. United States became much wealthier than the rest of the world. And it's a f historical fact that, that until 1861, Almost all of that cotton was grown by enslaved workers uh, of African origins. So, so slavery was a, a crucial uh, a factor in 
the development of the global cotton industry, but it was also thus a crucial factor in the development uh, of global industrialization and in the history of, 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 of global, global capitalism. And again, when we think, as I mentioned earlier, when we think about capitalism, we, we, we usually think about you know, the factories in Manchester or the factories maybe in Mulhouse in Alsace or elsewhere or the factories in, in Massachusetts, but we don't necessarily think uh, of, of, of the slave plantations uh, of the American South. And the story that I'm telling suggests that we need to think about this just as much as about these industrial sites. And then, of course, more broadly speaking, the, the, the wealth that was produced uh, on these plantations, but also in these factories, of course, was produced by people who were often exploited to a, a, to a really terrifying degree. I mean, we know that about the enslaved workers of the American South, uh, but that was also the case of often highly indebted cotton farmers in India or highly indebted cotton farmers in Central Asia or in, in Egypt or West Africa or elsewhere. And it was also, of course, the case for, for many of the early workers in these cotton factories who lived under truly terrifying conditions. Um, um, the majority of them were children uh, and women uh, because they could be paid the least and exploited the most. Uh, so there is this whole underbelly of the history of capitalism, of the, the mistreatment and underpayment of, of, of labor, uh, th that is really quite crucial to that story. Now, of course, uh, when it comes to slave labor, uh, you know, I think the basic starting point of the, of the question of the, uh, is, 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 is really to see that, that enslavement was first and foremost an effort to force people to work for others. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it and it, it 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 intersected then with ideas uh, of, of of social difference. Uh, some of them uh, relatively old, but some of them also uh, becoming ever more pronounced as slavery became ever more important to the system of uh, production of, of cotton, sugar, tobacco, and other agricultural commodities. So so I, so I, I don't think we can look at the history of slavery without also. Uh, putting a great emphasis on the importance, the economic importance of slave labor to the global economy as a whole and to the U.S. economy, to the American economy in particular. So you, obviously you're clearly emphasizing the economic engines that produce slavery. We're dealing in our own moment with, of course, Black Lives Matter in a country where black lives, frankly, didn't matter or haven't mattered. And all this uh, ideas of white supremacy and an American president who's you know, deifying Confederate warlords, and he considers himself probably the greatest American president since Jefferson Davis. And so, you know, we're, it's like we're living in this moment uh, where people aren't really talking about the economics of it so much as they're just talking about white supremacy and racism and how it's infected every corner of our, in our society, almost that it's so, it's so ubiquitous that to many it's invisible. And so that, I think, I don't know... Yes. That's that just it's in your book without you really getting into it. I, how do I describe that? It just sits there. No, no, no. I think I think you're absolutely right. But but of course, racism is then also a legacy of slavery, and racism has a huge impact then on the future economic history of the United States, also very much after the Civil War. Right. So so this structures everything. It structures housing markets. It structures labor markets. It structures marriage patterns. It structures access to educational institutions. Uh, it, 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 it becomes a very, very powerful fact of, of, of American life more broadly, as you mentioned, but also it becomes a very powerful fact of the structuring of the American economy way after slavery. So, so, so this history is not coming to an end in 1865 with, the, with emancipation, but it's a history that, that, that carries on uh, to the present day. And that is certainly extremely important to be emphasized. But I think what's also important to be emphasized is that they are just plain economic consequences of slavery that also last to the, to the consequences of which last to the present day. So, for example, the fact that millions of Americans have not been paid for their labor before 1865 has a huge impact on their ability to, the, of, of, of present generations of, of African Americans. Uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to accumulate capital and to accumulate educational attainments and to accumulate social capital and, and, and all of that. So, so I don't think you can think of the economic and uh, uh, the, the, the question of economic exploitation and economic inequality and the question of racism as separate. They're deeply interlinked to one another and the one produces the other. Of course, once you know, slavery ended, then 
racism became the way how the, the, the mechanism how people came to be uh, severely discriminated for the for the next hundred and, 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 and seventy five years or so. So that becomes in itself an important historical fact. And as I said, that's an important historical fact that also has very significant uh, economic uh, economic consequences. But I think this all needs to be thought of, you know, as as one thing. You cannot just focus on racism, you know, as as, as if it stands kind of totally on its own from economic factors and the long history of discrimination in the United States. And what was interesting in your book, you know, how the cotton production recovered pretty much on the, as the labor arrangements in the South changed from slavery to tenant farming or sharecropping and all these laws to enforce and still coerce the labor to feed the jaws of those mills in Massachusetts and also, of course, in England, which leads me to the big question. What's your take and feeling about reparations? I think uh, the... I mean, if you look at, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at, if, if you look at patterns of contemporary inequality, economic inequality, access to housing inequality, educational inequalities, social inequalities, all of that, then you cannot help but see that this is a result of, of, of a very long history. And this history clearly starts during slavery times. I mean, it's not only about slavery times, because as you mentioned earlier, there was a lot of uh, discrimination post-slavery, but 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 it is also significantly about slavery times. And again, slavery was first and foremost the theft of people's labor for very many generations. As I mentioned, millions of Americans didn't get paid for the work right. that they did for decades, for centuries. And the result of this partly explains contemporary inequalities. And if this is the case, I think then a very good uh, argument can be made that we as a nation do owe the descendants of enslaved uh, workers. We do owe them something, mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, what we owe them does include some kind of... Uh, uh, of, of, of compensation. Of course, you know, the injustice of the past cannot be made up right. by, by a, you know, even a large payment to the descendants of the people who had to suffer through slavery. But I think symbolically and also materially, reparations could, could, make, could make a difference. Um, and they could make a difference economically, which is much needed. But they could also begin a kind of larger national conversations about the responsibilities that all Americans have to confront the history of slavery and, and the racism that came after that. And I think that conversation is needed, and not just needed for addressing the issue of economic inequality, which is a very big and very significant one, but it is also needed because, as we can see now, I don't think the nation can really move forward politically without seriously confronting the issue of slavery. And in some ways that sounds kind of unlikely because uh, after all, you know, slavery was abolished in 1865 and no one alive today remembers the institution or, or lived through the institution. But I think that left such a stain on our politics and our culture, on our economy, on everything. And uh, I, I don't think we can really move forward on the many issues that, are, that we are confronting today and that are out there in the streets. Uh, without also really confronting that history. And one way to confront that history would be to seriously engage in a discussion on reparation. The first step towards restorative justice is recognizing the truth of our history. And, and yeah. we are enraptured by the mythology of our history as opposed to the truth, whether it's these origins of capitalism or uh, The Lost Cause, or Gone with the Wind, or cowboy movies, which really depict a genocide and people being removed forcibly from their land so that cotton basically can be grown. To, to face the truth of our history is the first step where you can open people's minds to the, to the cultural and social debt that's owed. And there are recent historical examples of reparations. I should say this. My mother was born in Berlin in the uh, like 33 or so, and she was fortunate enough to get out and uh, made her way to America by way of England. And my mother received reparations. And then I have had the opportunity to travel to Berlin on a few occasions. And there's such a, a clear recognition of the truth of the history. And to me, it could be beneficial to, of course, the victims of that history, 
but also to the, 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 the children and grandchildren and whatever of, of the perpetrators of that history. It's, it's a liberating force, the truth. And you, my friend, are a soldier for truth. So I feel the passion as you just discuss this with me now, because without saying so, without throwing that bomb into that debate, you make the case for it in your book really powerfully. So I appreciate that Thank so you. much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. I think this, the, the, the German story in some ways, you know, obviously it's very different in many ways, but, 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 it's, but I think it is also, it is also relevant. And, um, and uh, you know, when, when in the 1950s, when, when Germany started to pay reparations to the state of Israel, it was a very small minority of Germans who supported those payments. I think it was like in the like 10 percent or 15 percent, perhaps. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of Germans opposed these kinds of reparations. But, you know, over the years, things, things changed and, and, and people were forced to confront this, this history. And I think it has, in the end, you know, made for a much more vibrant democracy, and it has enabled people to think about the future in, in, in new kinds of ways. And I think, you know, while the American story is, is of course, very different historically and, and politically as well, but, 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 but from, from, from the German example, I think I can, I can learn that, that it's, it's, it's impossible to move forward without really confronting uh, this history. This history is going to haunt us. I mean, us now being Americans, mm-hmm. it's, haunt, it's going to haunt us forevermore if we don't deal with it. And, and I feel like maybe now there is a good moment to do this. And, uh, and there is perhaps also, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we, we have a president who is obviously uh, not particularly willing to, to, to consider these issues, but, but, but on the other hand, we have a very large number of Americans who seem to be much more open to confronting this history than might have been the case uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the past. And so, you know, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's start with it right now. And, uh, and I don't think it will be easy for anyone, but, but I don't think we can build a future without having done this. Wow. Well, that's what I feel, you know. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, one of the things I said, well, I have, I, I'm a comedian, so I used to do this joke where I go, well, you know, I'm Jewish. My people, we didn't own slaves. We, they just auctioned them. They invested in them. They marketed them. They advertised them. They insured them. They cross-collateralized them. They securitized them. They mortgaged them. They amortized them. They depreciated them. My point is, and I know you get it, but slavery wasn't just a sin of the South. It was a whole system that, you, you know, right. almost... Right. If you were breathing the air, you were in some way uh, part of it, which brings me to a question, because reading your book, it seemed to me almost impossible, given all the forces that you described, that the North would actually go to war with the, ostensibly to abolish this institution, slavery, upon which so much of Wall Street and the economy and the exports of this new country were sitting on. It's almost like, how do they even have a civil war, you know, after reading your book? That was, that was part of this thing that sort of hit me also as a question. Right. Yeah, but, but, but I think you're absolutely right that, that one of the arguments of the book is that, that uh, when we think about uh, the empire of cotton, it's, 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 a national, uh, it's, it's a national thing and it's also a global thing. And then, of course, uh, there's, uh, slavery is, is a national institution when you look at the United States, partly because, you know, after the revolution, the, the slavery was legal in all parts of the United States, but, but also partly for the reasons that you mentioned, that the New York banking sector, the, the Boston merchants, Harvard University, <laughs> right. they all benefited from the enslavement uh, of, of people in, in the American South and from the plantation economies throughout the Caribbean and in the South America as, as, as well. And so we can't just tell that as a, as a regional history. You know, this is the problem of the South and somehow, you know, in, we in New England or in California or wherever, you know, we're the good guys and, and we have nothing to do with this history. That, that I think, would be fundamentally, uh, would be fundamentally uh, wrong. And, of course, uh, m- many people in the, in, the, in the North benefited from slavery and, uh, and also politically supported the institution of slavery. But then we also have to acknowledge, of course, that there was significant opposition to slavery. I mean, first of all, from the beginnings of slavery, the enslaved themselves fought with all the, po- the power that they had against the enslavement. 
and sometimes they staged a revolution, such as in Saint-Domingue, which then became Haiti. Right. And sometimes they they ran away, you know, and they ran to the to, they ran to to Philadelphia to get away from slavery. And these were all acts of resistance that weakened the institution of slavery. But then uh, there were also uh, people in in in, in, the, in the in the north, in New England, in the Midwest, who opposed slavery and who organized a powerful political movement against slavery, uh, maybe the most radical political movement ever in American history, because it was a movement that was directed against some of the most powerful economic and political interests of their times. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them, uh, as Manisha Sinha in her book describes, uh, were, had huge problems because of the anti-slavery uh, positions, but eventually they won that struggle against slavery. So we need to acknowledge that as well, and we need to you know, in some ways, these people should be our heroes because the struggle against slavery obviously made a huge difference to the development of, of the United States and the global economy. And then, you know, so why, why did the North fight the Civil War? In some ways, that's a good question for the reasons that you just mentioned. But, but on the other hand, I will, well, my answer to that question would be that, for one, there was this important strand of, of, of abolitionist poli politics, and there were also... There was a more moderate but still anti-slavery politics. Uh, there was the newly created Republican Party who wanted to have nothing to do uh, with the further expansion of, of slavery and who won the elections of 1860. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there, was, there were also important forces in the United States, including in places such as Boston and New York and Philadelphia and elsewhere, who envisioned the future of the United States not as some kind of slaveholding republic as people in Virginia or Alabama or Mississippi envisioned the future of the United States, but they envisioned the future of the United States as a free labor empire uh, that, uh, that engaged uh, not so much just in agricultural production but also in industrialization. And it was these people who eventually in 1861, when the, the, the South seceded, uh, uh, were important factors in saying, you know, enough is enough. We we can't we can't take that. Then engaged in a kind of violent reunification of the nation. So 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 we have to you know we have to also if we look at it from a chronological perspective, we have to see that you know slavery was a very important economic force for the United States as a whole in the 1820s and 1830s. Mm -hmm. But 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 by the 1840s 1850s things begin to shift. So suddenly, it's not just the export of cotton into global markets, but it's also industrialization taking place in the Connecticut River Valley, in, in, in the hills of New England. It's about the expansion of free labor, wheat agriculture in the American West. So, so there is now a totally different dynamic developing by the 1840s, 1850s. And for, for people who were engaged with that part of the American economy, the future was, again, not in in the enslavement of agricultural cultivators in order to grow cotton, but the, but the future was to be industrial. It was to be a protected economy that, that, that is not exposed to European competition to the same degree that Southerners thought was necessary. And it was an economy that was fundamentally built on free labor. And of course, that was also then a tradition that, that connected very well to important strands of the American Revolution. So, so there were these links then as well. It's so interesting, you know, and especially the global dimension. You were mentioning, you know, I, I was in, like I said, Charleston, and I sit on the banks of the, the sort of toe of the city, and I stared out across the water, and there was Fort Sumter and all these Confederate statues and John Calhoun statue and all these cannons aimed at Fort Sumter still as, as part of this park. And one of the things that your book points out so incredibly well, with the firing of those cannons in the onset of that conflagration, that catastrophe, it also sent shutters all the way into Bombay and the Indian cotton markets across the world. So we, you know, this global matrix that we're in reminded me of like, I don't know, like the supply chains that we're looking at today with the, you know, the manufacturers of, cell, of cell phones and computers and, well, maybe things aren't so different. I don't know. So... Right. I mean, that's an important argument of the book, that you, that you can only look at these things from a truly global perspective. And the kind of global connectedness of the economy is not something that's of very recent vintage of the 1970s or beyond, but it's something that's really at the very core of what capitalism is about. Earlier we talked about the state, and I emphasized the importance of the state to the development of capitalism. But I think we just as much need to emphasize the importance of this integrated but hierarchical 
economic world that capitalism uh, creates. And thus, things that are happening at Fort Sumter in 1861 have an impact on Bombay, on Alexandria, on Manchester, on Mulhouse, on all of these places all over the world. And of course, Southerners were quite aware of that. And indeed, you know, when they argued that cotton is king, they believed that they are going to win the war partly because Europe could not possibly live without the cotton that came out of the United States. And therefore, Europe would side with the Confederacy. Right. But there they made a huge mistake because what they did not understand is, was that by the 1860s, there were other ways to produce cotton that did not depend on enslaving uh, the worker, and uh, there were other regions of the world that could produce cotton for European uh, factories, and that they, they didn't appreciate that capitalism had developed a dynamic that that did not primarily rest anymore on uh, on enslaving the worker, and 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 then thus you know they found out pretty soon that Prussia nor France nor the United Kingdom uh, nor Russia would would support the Confederacy to a degree that would have enabled it to to withstand the Union forces. So that's a great point about how nimble and fungible capitalism was and how quickly they were able to adapt. And then, of course, that sets in motion a whole slew of colonial events in India uh, with respect to cotton. And I guess it's not an accident that the spinning wheel is in the center of the Indian flag. (laughs) Um, So it's, I don't know, to me, it's just so fascinating. And Sven, I got to tell you, I just, this conversation is so satisfying for me, and I'm sure it will be for others. And, you know, I applied to Harvard, and I didn't get in. I had to go to Berkeley instead. So I take great pleasure in actually finally getting a personal seminar with a Harvard history professor. Oh, my God, my dream finally came true, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I just want to thank you, and I know you got to move along to your your, I guess it's your evening in Germany, and I really hope... I get a chance to meet you and shake your hand and get to know you. That would be terrific. Thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and terrific work. And just give the folks out there a heads up when they can get a chance to, you know, check out the the next Sven Beckert opus when you do the deep dive into capitalism. I mean, I've wrote a little more than half of it now, so I'm already in the 20th century. So I started in the 15th century, and I have finished the first five centuries, so there's only one more to go. Oh, so this is like, but what is it like? Unfortunately, that's also the most complicated, so... Uh, okay, well, I can't wait to read it. It's another two years, so I think. Okay, well, good luck and congratulations, and I so look forward to meeting you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, take care, Bye-bye. Sven. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. So there you have it, folks, an incredibly interesting conversation with Sven Beckert. I wanted to invite you to check this book out, Empire of Cotton, A Global History. It can shed light on our current moment in a way that you won't imagine. And thanks for hanging with me. Till next time, namaste, shalom, and aloha. By that I mean, namashaloha. Aloha.